In his letter to the Galatians, the Apostle Paul wrote, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. For more than 20 years, God has used Bill and Annabelle Gillum to help people understand and appropriate the truths of Galatians 2.20. Through their tapes, books, seminars, and nationwide radio program, thousands of people have found freedom and fulfillment as they have learned how to let Christ live in and through them. Now just imagine allowing God himself to express his life through you in your family, your work, and everywhere you go. Join Dr. Bill and Annabelle Gillum and discover why Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. For us Christians, you guys all know that there's two ways that we can operate. Uh, we can walk according to the flesh. The Bible calls it walking, doesn't it? It means just how you act. We can walk according to the flesh, or we can walk in the Spirit, right? And that's it. And um, I used to figure, well, walking after the flesh, that's chasing women and getting drunk and stuff. And, of course, that qualifies, bro. <laughs> but... Um, Walking according to the flesh isn't limited to that. There are lots of folks that walk according to the flesh that don't do that kind of stuff. Walking according to the flesh is simply depending upon yourself and your abilities and the techniques that you have developed here on planet Earth to get you through the day. And if you trust on, in those things, then you're walking according to the flesh, okay? Now, walking in the Spirit, I figured that, hey, that's going to Sunday school and church and all that kind of stuff. But, hey, there are people that do that and do it in the flesh, right? So, so walking in the Spirit is understanding a basic truth, and that is that the Christian life is not difficult to live. It's impossible. Have you discovered that? Have you discovered that God never intended you to live the Christian life? There's one person who has ever lived the Christian life, and of course, that's Jesus Christ. And one of the reasons that he came into us is to express the Christian life through us. And when we understand how to do that and begin to bring that online, then we're walking in the Spirit. So all day long, we can jump back and forth between these two polarized ways of operating either in the spirit or according to the flesh. Now, as we begin tonight, <clears throat> I want us to pray and trust the Holy Spirit to teach us, okay? Because you can, you can trust in your own intelligence and you'll absolutely miss everything that we're talking about. Spiritual truth must be spiritually apprehended or appropriated, understood. And only the Holy Spirit can do that. He's our teacher. We all know that, don't we? So why don't we just keep our eyes open and just pray together after me, okay? Dear Holy Spirit, you guys say that. Dear Holy Spirit, I choose right now, I choose right now to believe that you're my teacher. To believe that you're my teacher. And I'm not real sure that Bill and Annabelle are going to teach me all the truth. So I'm going to trust you for an understanding of how to eat the meat and throw away the bones. Now, I won't lean to my own understanding. That means depend on my own smarts. That means depend on my own smarts. I'm going to depend on you. Now, I really mean this. I really mean this. <clears throat> and if you give me an understanding... I intend to bring that online in my life. I don't want just an intellectual itch scratched. I mean it. In Jesus' name. Okay. We're ready now, right? All right. Now, I want to establish three quick points. Number one, 
God is love. And he created you to love you unconditionally. So he fixed you where you would need to be loved unconditionally. So all of you are sitting there needing that. Because if you didn't need that, then you wouldn't need God. Wasn't that slick? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Point number two. God's job description. He runs things. That's what he does for a living. When he goes to the office in the morning, he runs the universe, okay? <laughs> right? That's what, job, that's what gods do. They run things, right? Now then, he's got ways of running the universe. Let's call those laws. And the Bible says that all of his ways are good. All of his laws are good. Like, for example, the law of gravity. Now, that is not a natural law. There's no such thing as that. He created that. Once upon a time, there was no gravity, okay? He created the law of gravity, and it's a wonderful law. Keeps you from flying off the planet. Makes water slides work. Wonderful. <laughs> but now, you could get out here and dive off the house onto the driveway to demonstrate the law of gravity for all of us, and you'd go splat, man. Now, is that an angry God, or is that you being Delbert Dumb? <laughs> right? Delbert Dumb, yeah. I mean, I think God gets, that's not an angry God. God gets a lot of bad press for stuff like that, right? Because of the dumb stuff that we do. All right, now, when you and I, this is point number three. When you and I showed up on the planet, here's what we did. We each drew an imaginary circle around ourselves and we kind of homesteaded this turf. We set up a little kingdom in direct competition with God. And we established ourselves as God of this little circle, God with a little G. Now, you were willing to let the real God carry out the heavy stuff like sunrises and stuff, but your attitude is you're going to be God of this circle. You are going to run this circle. Your attitude is, this is my life. I've got my rights. I do things my way. So a little play on Tolkien, I call that Lord of the Ring. And so as you played Lord of the Ring, trying to establish patterns for living, which will get you through the day, and many of your patterns for living are designed to milk love out of people so you can get your need for love satisfied. But don't you see that that's conditional love? So it's a cheap substitute for God's unconditional love, which he's bestowed on man through Jesus Christ. So you started off on the left foot right off the bat, right? We all did. Okay, now, the cardinal sin of man gang is independence. That's what I have just described. Look, Adam didn't break the Ten Commandments. There weren't any Ten Commandments. What did the guy do? He wrote the first personal declaration of independence, Alan. That's what he did. He established himself. He says, I'll decide what's good. For what's good. I'll decide what's bad. I'll do it my way. And he passed this on to the rest of us, and so all of us showed up on the planet as lords of the ring. Now then, God has designed man in three component parts. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And it says that we are spirit, soul, and body. The scriptures say that God is spirit. And they also say you are created in the image of God. Therefore, Cherry, what are you? You're a spirit critter. You and I are spirit critters who temporarily live in earth suits. An author named C.S. Lovett has tabbed the body an earth suit. I love that term. That's exactly what it is. It's an earth suit. It's made out of earth, and it's designed for planet earth and nowhere else. You can take it off the planet, but you've got to house it in an earthy environment if you do it, or it'll die, right? It's an earth suit. So, you are a spirit critter in an earth suit. You are not a physical critter with a spirit. Okay, that's a very critically important point now because we're going to be talking about your identity. Who are you? And you've got to zoom in on the fact that you are a spirit critter, not a physical critter with a spirit. 
Now, the word soul. The word soul and the word psychology come from the same root, meaning personality. So your soul, then, is your personality, your mind, your will, and your emotions. Now, Jesus came to planet Earth and visited the planet, and gang, Jesus was God in an earth suit, Scripture. All the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily in him. That was God, gang, walking around on this planet. Is that mind-blowing or what? Now, while he was here, he met a guy named Nicodemus who wanted to live forever with God. And he says, okay. He says, here's how you do it. You've got to get born, literally, from above. We call it born again. And Nicodemus says, I don't understand that. You mean I've got to get back in mom? He said, no, son, now that'd give you two earth suits if you could pull that off. And you don't need another earth suit, Nick. <clears throat> Your problem is <clears throat> that up here in the spirit, you're dead in a hammer. You were a spiritual stillbirth. <laughs> <laughs> All you got to do to, be, to have a dead spirit is just show up on the planet, man. It's standard equipment, right? You got it from your ancestor. And we're talking spiritual stuff now, gang, okay? And so he says, Nicodemus, they that worship God must worship him in spirit. But you can't do that because you're dead spiritually. You got a spirit, but it's a dead spirit. It, it, it doesn't function toward God, Okay? So, <clears throat> looking again then at soul then, if you look at your diagram there, your soul and your spirit then are housed in your earth suit. Now, your earth suit is a vehicle through which you relate to people and the earthy environment. So, right now, the real Bill, my soul and spirit here, are making the lips wiggle on my earth suit, and noises are coming out of it, and they're penetrating your earth suit. And you and I are communing with one another or fellowshipping, my soul and your soul, personality, okay? So you and I then live in two dimensions simultaneously. Our soul and spirit relate to people through the body, and we relate to God through the spirit. Now, let's, let's move on to the next diagram. And uh, let's break the personality down into mind, will, and emotions. And let's give you a brain in your earth suit. Now, gang, your brain cannot be your mind because the brain is made out of meat. And when your earth suit dies, your brain's going to stay right here and your mind's going to eject. But if your mind were your brain, then your mind would die and you wouldn't know whether you'd gone to heaven or hell. So your mind can't be your brain. Your brain is simply a body organ. It's like a liver or a kidney or something else. It's a computer. It's designed to gather data through the sensory perceptors and organize these data into structures or constructs that you and I would call meaning. If you were going to use computer language, you'd call it the printout on a, or the image on the screen or the hard copy. Now, if you've got a computer, you've got to have some folks that can run the thing, or it's a paperweight, right? Just a dust catcher. So, your soul operates the computer. Now, <clears throat> the printouts come flying through this computer at thousands of per hour, I guess, and mind and emotions have to analyze these data. So, mind then analyzes the data and then tells Will what you believe you ought to do about this stimulus situation. Now, Will's the big boss, and Will works like a light switch. You either do or you don't. And there's no notch in the middle. That's choosing not to choose. Either do or you don't, okay? So whereas mine tells Will what you believe about the situation, feeler over here, your emotions, will kind of knee-jerk to the stimulus and tell Will how you feel about the situation. And then it's up to Will to make the decisions. And Christian, you're absolutely on the hook to do the will of God. You don't make up your mind about anything. That's a misnomer. Mind is an analyzer and a recommender. You make up your will about things. 
<clears throat> you say, Bill, please don't help me anymore, man. You're getting me in trouble here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now then, you were the most self-centered critter that God ever made when you showed up on the planet. Let me prove it to you. You're six months old. You wake up at 2 a.m., you're cold, you're wet, and you're hungry. Do you lie there and, and reason, now, poor mom, bless her heart, she needs her rest. I think I'll just tough it out till dawn. <laughs> Are you kidding me? You scream, get out of the rack and fix the kids. You think only about the big number one. Now, this is going to backfire on us because, you see, since we're so self-centered, we're going to learn only about ourselves from the feedback we get from other folks and from the environment. This is going to be mom and dad, relatives, peers, whatever. We learn only about ourselves. Now then, <clears throat> you've got a mind, you've got emotions. So let my right hand represent your thinker and my left hand your feeler on a one to ten scale. Your feeler reacts to your thinker. Whatever you set your mind on, feeler reacts to that. So I look down here on the carpet and there's a rattlesnake getting ready to strike me on the ankle. In my mind, I believe I'm in terrible danger. That's 10. I quickly feel terrified. That's 10. Now I look more closely, Alan, I see it's made out of rubber. So mine goes back to zero, see? I can set my mind anywhere I want to. If I couldn't, God wouldn't say, Bill, set your mind. Bill, think on these things. See, I, I, I got control of my mind. So I say, I'm safe with my mind. But Feeler says, I ain't buying it. <laughs> <laughs> See, feeler's going to come down all right, but like a BB sinking in oil, right? It's going to take it a long time to finally get down there at the bottom. So let's say 30 minutes later, feeler's down to about an eight. I open a drawer, a spider runs up my sleeve. Boom, boom, everything back to 10 again. Now, gang, what if you're a little kid and you're being reared in a home with a rattlesnake for a dad or a spider for a mother or a live-in grandmother or an older brother or sister or whatever, and they just keep your mind and feeler both kissing 10 all day long. Now, you go to bed at night, mind zeroes out. That's the way God designed it. Well, feeler starts down, but gang, after you've lived in this environment four years or so, you're a four-year-old now, don't you see that feeler's going to begin to lose its elasticity? That by the time the alarm goes off in the morning, your feeler's only down to about an eight. Now, God has shown me something. The same thing's going to happen to your feeler that happens to your arm if you put it in a cast and leave it there for two years. You take the cast off, you still got muscles, but what good are they? They've atrophied. Your arm's useless. And you have to rehabilitate the muscles. The same thing happens to your feeler. Everything below eight disappears, bro. And so you enter life at age four operating with the top two digits on your emotion Richter scale. You see that? Now, this is, psychologists say 85% of your personality is set in concrete by the time you're five. I think what they're observing, brother, is they're, they're seeing a stuck feeler. They're evaluating a stuck feeler because people go by how they feel. So put this kid in an environment that calls for a four-point increase on his thermostat. He can't do it, man. You see that? And if you want see what a handicap this is going to be for this person. Okay, now <clears throat> you've got a memory bank and you've got memory traces that are burned through your memory bank. Your memory bank is like the first national bank, only instead of holding money, it holds memories, memories of your experiences on planet Earth. And these memory traces, I've drawn them here in your brain. These are patterns these are habit patterns that you have developed, and I call them green highways. And they range in width, I guess, from eight-lane superhighways down to coon trails, depending upon traffic flow or depending upon the intensity with which they're burned in there in the first place. Now, notice where I have put these green highways. I've put some underneath your mind. These are patterns of how you think. I've put some underneath the will, patterns of how you act, and I've put some under the emotions. That's your stuck feeler. 
think, act, feel. Now, people, after you get saved, those old patterns become your unique version of the flesh. This is your old patterns for living. If you're into computers, Anna, like you are, that's the software program in your computer, and you designed it and installed it. <laughs> you installed your own software program to help you play Lord of the Ring more effectively. You see what I'm saying now? All right. Now, <clears throat> I want you to dry, uh, lay your stuff down in your lap and put your hands out here in front of you and clasp your hands like this. And I want you to look and see which, side, which thumb is up on top. See that? Now, when I say break, here's what we're going to do. We're going to open up our hands and bring them back together, only we're going to lace them the opposite way so that the thumbs are different. You ready? Break. Now, how's that feel? <laughs> it's just not right, is it? It's just different. Now, gang, listen to me. This is what a stuck feeler does. The devil is going to try to get you to keep on acting according to your feeler's comfort zone, even if your comfort zone is a miserable comfort zone. At least you know what to do with it. You know how to handle things in that environment. You can play Lord of the Ring in there. See what I'm saying? Now, walking in the spirit gang is going to require you to choose to walk by what you believe according to what God's Word says, and it'll feel at times like that, <laughs> I guess. It'll feel way off base. You'll feel like you've been a phony brother because you're not acting according to how you feel. But praise God, you'll be acting according to what you believe by your faith and that God is saying in the Word of God about you. Isn't that exciting? Now, your old ways then, your flesh, are your old ways which you developed through independent living by playing Lord of the Ring. That's the definition of flesh. My old ways, which I developed through independent living. Now, let's see if we can establish what some of your old ways might look like. <clears throat> what you learned about yourself by playing Lord of the Ring here on planet Earth, Tommy. All right, now, first of all, what kind of feedback you got from parents and peers? Now, let me establish something. This is not a mom bashing session, all right? You want to know why your mom acted like a hammerhead at times? Go back and see what happened to her when she was a little kid. Now, let's don't beat on Granny. You know why Granny acted like a hammerhead? Go back. Who, what does the Bible say about who our enemy is? We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with powers and principalities, right? The devil's our enemy, gang, not mom. And if you're in a so-called support group where you get together every week and bash dad because he abused you when you were a kid, you're going to get worse, not better. As you talk about that, oh, you reminisce about that with others, and they reminisce, and you get upset and angry and hostile, and on six months from now, you'll be worse. That is not Christ as life living through you. It's fine to get together and talk, but only if we understand what the answer to this stuff is, who we are in Christ, and how to let him live through us to overcome this old junk, these old highways that are in the brain. All right, so let's take a look at this. Here's the first kid. He gets no physical love. Now, what happens to him? Does he learn, <clears throat> gee whiz, it's hard for my mom and dad to show physical love. They really got hang-ups. He does not learn that. He's learning about himself. So what he learns is, I am unlovely. I believe I am unlovable. And if he believes that long enough, what happens to feeler? It gets stuck. And there's somebody in here feeling unlovely. And you have designed and installed your software program to handle feelings of unloveliness. And maybe, you know, you want love, but if you ever get it, you're like a dog chasing a car that finally catches it. See, what do I do with this? You, you can't <laughs> handle it. It feels like that, see? <laughs> and you want to get back and make it feel like that again. And that's flesh game, all right? There's somebody in here, and you were ignored as a kid. 
Now, it doesn't make any difference how you were ignored. Your dad could have left home before you were ever born, or he might have been a pastor and he was out soul winning every night, and he just never paid any attention to you. A little kid spells love, T-I-M-E, spend time with me. Now, Dad, whatever you spend your time with, <coughs> I'm worth less than that. I believe I'm worth less than what you spend your time with. I believe I'm worthless. I believe I'm worthless. I believe I'm worthless. What's happened to Feeler? I feel worthless. Feeler gets stuck. I'm 25. I'm saved. And I feel worthless. I have a low feeling of self-esteem. Now, the world has lots of ways you can try to shore this up and, and, and improve on this problem. You can get the right set of wheels and get you the right house with the right address, the right threads, get you a Mr. T starter set to wear around your neck, <laughs> the right wristwatch. <laughs> now, look, I'm not knocking your automobile and stuff like that. Listen, listen. If you're, if you're troubled about that Mercedes yours, what you really need to do is donate that to a good ministry. <laughs> just, let, let's us just meet together after this session tonight. <laughs> I'm just saying that if you have to have all that stuff so you can feel better about yourself as you stop at the street lights and, you know, and park next to the fancy cars and stuff, if you, if you feel like you have to have that stuff, you, you've got a self-esteem problem, and you're using the flesh to try to solve the problem. And, and you're worth so much more than that. You're selling out to the company store, man. All right, how about this one? Critical of me. You, you brought in your report card. It had four A's and a C on it, a C in penmanship. And they hammered you for the C in penmanship, never even mentioned the A's. And you believed that you were a failure. That's the only kind of feedback you got. I'm a failure. And so if you believe it, then you begin to feel like a failure. Feeler gets stuck. And here you are an adult feeling like a failure, and maybe you're a roaring success on the job. But your feeler doesn't agree with it. All right, how about this one? You were reared with a perfectionist, and you couldn't hack it. And so you believed you're inadequate to, to the task, and now then you feel that way. Let's say it was your mom. And so you're making the bed. And she comes in, and she takes a look at it, and she comes over, and she raises up the bedspread and reaches up under there and snaps those sheets out, and you're 27 years old. And, and she... <laughs> 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 I'm not knocking your perfectionism, gang. Perfectionism in, in itself is not bad. It, it's okay. I'm knocking the dynamic of how you developed it and why. What was your motive? And motivation for perfectionism is so you can perform perfectly so you can get love out of people and bestow it upon yourself. It's a substitute for the unconditional love of God through Jesus Christ. But I assure you, I want you for my surgical nurse. I don't want that person who says, oh, just stick it in him anywhere. I, I want you, man. <laughs> okay. Now, there's an old boy sitting in here, and he's listening to this lecture. He says, man, that guy is nailing my wife. She's got that stuck feeler. She's got a stuck feeler. And he comes up at the half, and he says, Bill, you're talking about my wife. And, son, if you could help her, I would be so appreciative. Cause we try to talk. She just bursts into tears. She, her old feeler must be stuck way up there. Bill, I thank God every day that my feeler's not stuck. But now let's look at the old boy. He was reared in a home where they showed no emotion at all. He, so he just crammed it all in, okay? And so he feels inhibited. <clears throat> so I talk with him about this problem of his, of his wife's, and, and I'm sympathetic toward him, and we pray together about it. And so I want to show him I love him, so we get up off the floor, and I'm just, I just going to hug him, you know. I reach out to hug him, and it's like he swallowed a curtain rod. You know, when you try to hug this guy, he can't respond to that. Now, what is his problem? His feet are stuck. His feet are just as stuck as his woman. It's just a different emotion. He feels inhibited. The dude can't emote. Okay? My point is not, let's beat on everybody or beat on this guy. My point is, how many of us have a problem with a stuck feeler? Everybody in this room. But you don't know it because it doesn't feel like it. 
You've always felt that way. But it's a stuck feeler, troops. Unless it's all lining up on the Word of God, it's a stuck feeler. You follow me now? All right, so we talked about some kind of yucky flesh up here. Let's talk about some USDA choice flesh. Now, down here at the bottom, uh, here's somebody, and you got the message, you do things really well. You are really good. And you were captain of the football team, and you married the homecoming queen, you're a million-dollar producer, you know, you're the youngest deacon in the history of the church, et cetera, et cetera, ad infinitum, see? And you have developed self-confidence. Now, what is self-confidence? It's confidence in self and self's ability to play Lord of the Ring very well. <laughs> Thud. Now, we're exhorted by the Lord, put no confidence in the flesh. And that's what self-confidence is. Who are we to put our confidence in? Christ, as he expresses himself through us, using our talents and our abilities and our earth suits, our personalities, but always using them to bring honor to Jesus Christ rather than using it to milk and get our own needs met out of the environment. That's flesh game. Okay, maybe you've got a pretty earth suit or a handsome earth suit. You drew that from God. <clears throat> and ever since you've been little, well, you've been winning prizes. You've got ribbons on the wall and, and uh, you understand really well why people invite you to their birthday parties. You would too if you were making up the list. You know, because all you got to do is just stand because you're so pretty. It's flesh, gang. It's just simply flesh. Now then, <clears throat> I have developed here a flesh inventory. Don't look at it now. But before we get together next week, I want you to trust the Holy Spirit now. Don't you do it with your own intelligence. Sir, show me if my flesh is in here somewhere. And then, and then follow the instructions and work out the instructions there. Now, we still haven't hit upon the biggie. The biggie is performance-based acceptance along with the physical appearance-based acceptance. And it goes like this. If you perform well enough, I will pay you off with love. And so the schools are a primary source for the devil to work this number on people. And this is Christian schools, public schools, both. So you have there in your book uh, some papers that one of our kids brought home. This is our number four, uh, number three son. And um, he's an, uh, an editor in New York now. <laughs> but you can see in uh, grade one, he didn't get started off too swiftly, okay? All right, so you can see that he, he, uh, he gave it six shots here. His name's Will. He got three right and three wrong, so I take this paper up to show it to the teacher and ask her some questions about it. I say, now, ma'am, I see old Will's having a little struggle here, but now he got that word nine right. How come you didn't say something about that? And she'd say, well, now he got that right, and that's our goal, so, uh, you know, that, that, that's good. But it's, it's the first word here, the word ten, that we've got a problem with, which he pronounces tan because he's an oaky. And, and so, <laughs> so uh, we're going to have to teach that boy that this word is pronounced ten, and it's spelled T-E-N. I said, yes, ma'am, I, I see that. Oh, that makes sense. <clears throat> so I go home, my tail between my legs. Now, her goal, gang, is she's got to find something wrong with this kid, and by doing that, she's going to help him, right? Look at this math paper over here. A hundred, but messy. She can't get him on math, so she's going to get him on cleanliness today. <laughs> People, this is the way that I ran my home. This is the way I was a husband to Annabelle. This is what Preston began to be re reared under until God began to open my eyes from the Word of God as to what I was doing to my family. I had my red pencil out with Annabelle especially, and there's no way she's going to win with me. No matter how well she does it, I'm always going to find something wrong with it. Kept that red pencil sharp and had me a shoulder holster designed for it, you know. <laughs> Carried my shoulder. I whipped that baby out. I was fast as wide earth, man. 
<laughs> on the draw. And I took this, this, this godly, beautiful, wonderful woman, and I reduced her to where she was suicidal with this thing between my teeth, with sarcasm and criticism and with humiliating her. And after I got saved, I kept right on doing it, brother. The difference was now I wanted to change, but I didn't understand how. I had no clue that somehow Jesus Christ had accomplished for me the ability to overcome that. Now, in the second session, we're going to validate what Bill just mentioned in the first session about us and our marriage. Even though we were both very dedicated Christian people, we were in a self-destruct marriage. Our marriage was going to destruct. But today, today I have a marriage that I could wish for any woman. And there are literally thousands of couples who could say the same thing. We met one of those couples in May. When we met them, they had given up all hope on their marriage. They weren't even going to try any longer. They came to the seminar. They listened to the teaching that you're going to be hearing. And they realized that they were hearing truth. We saw them again in August and they're going to be renewing their wedding vows. A new husband and a new wife. Oh, there is such hope. There is such hope. Not just for married people, but for anyone who wants to live a life of victory, who wants to live above the roller coaster existence that they've known. Now, in session two, we're going to share how Bill and I developed our unique versions of the flesh. And then in session three, we turn a corner, a beautiful corner, and we start talking about what God did through Jesus Christ to rescue us. We're going to start talking about how we can live a life of victory instead of a life of defeat.